Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's program, which is generously supported by the museum's Friends of Asian Art Group. My name is Donnie Chan, and I am the Associate Curator of Asian Art at the Walters Art Museum. Now, before we get started, I would like to state that the Walters Art Museum acknowledges the Susquehannock and Piscataway nations that originally inhabited this land, the tribal groups, including Lumbee and Cherokee that migrated here, and the indigenous peoples whose ancestors are represented in the objects we steward in our collection. To learn more about our land acknowledgement, please visit the link posted in the comment section below. Also, please note that this program is being recorded and will be available on the museum's YouTube channel and Facebook page. So today's talk is titled, Awaken, Exploring the Visual Cosmos of Tibetan Buddhism, and it will be presented by Dr. Jeffrey Durham. Jeff is Associate Curator of Himalayan Art at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, California. His recent exhibitions include Divine Bodies, A Guided Tour of Hell, and Awaken, from which this talk is derived. Prior to arriving at the Asian Art Museum, Jeff was Professor of Religion at the University of North Carolina and St. Thomas Aquinas College. His current research focuses on Indo-Tibetan visualization techniques and their relationship to artistic expression in Vajrayana Buddhist contexts. If you have questions during the talk, please leave them in the comments and we'll address them during the Q&A. Now, please join me in welcoming Jeff to our program. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to Donnie and all of the staff at the Walters for inviting me today to your virtual meeting room for us to have a wonderful virtual discussion on Awaken, a Tibetan Buddhist journey toward enlightenment. Now, in order for me to tell you a little bit about this, I'm going to show you some slides. And to do that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. And here we go. So, awaken. That's a great big word in the middle of the screen there. What is it all about? Well, in addition to being one of the longest running Himalayan shows that very few people ever saw because of the pandemic, awaken is something or was designed to be something very special. In a nutshell, this exhibition presents the most magnificent Himalayan objects from two world-class collections installed and interpreted so as to be simultaneously immersive and transformative. There is a museological mouthful for you. It was conceived from the very beginning by myself and my colleagues in terms of the integral relationship between traditional and contemporary art, and it's also organized as a kind of hero's journey where the visitor meets fascinating figures, explores enlightened environments, and perhaps even emerges with their perspective transformed. So while we go through the exhibition, I'll be speaking about it in the present tense, although it is now deinstalled both from the Asian Art Museum and from the Rubin Museum in New York. All right, so let's go ahead and begin our trip our hero's dirt journey, let's begin it in the ordinary world. That's where they all begin. And to represent the existence that we are pleased with no small irony to call normal, we present you in the installation in San Francisco with Francis Ford Coppola's epic making film, Koyaanisqatsi. Now in the images in this slide that you see from Koyaanisqatsi, you can see the sun rising and rush hour beginning and on continues the day until the sun sets. And of course, this race continues, this time at night, as the moon rises. The image at the end of the gallery space, which you see there on the right, is a contemporary artwork by Tibetan Nepalese American artist, Tsering Sherpa, who currently has a show up at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Now this work represents the results of our race to nowhere. It's a condition where, famously, as the poet said, the center cannot hold. It's a space where the center cannot hold and everything falls apart. Our sense of self fragments into a thousand, each one a task, a danger, 
or race, and together, these two works, Luxation and Quayana Scotsi, comprise the exhibition's first experience, the time track. Now, Mr. Sherpa's painting itself is called Luxation. Now, this term comes from the Latin to dislocate and refers on one level to the dislocation felt in Nepal in the aftermath of Kathmandu's devastating 2015 earthquake. On another level, luxation evokes the dislocation that Tibetans have felt in the wake of their diaspora after the Cultural Revolution. And further still, it reflects the fragmented condition in which many of us ordinarily find ourselves, whether as a result of modernity, technology, or some more universal aspect of the human condition. So, like all great artworks, luxation has multiple levels of interpretation. But what can we say about this artwork as it appears before us in all of its rather naked visuality? Well, certainly individual pieces of the work make bits of sense. But we can scarcely discern what that full picture might be, can we? But before our journey toward enlightenment is finished, we will understand how these pieces fit together, and we will encounter, in full, the figure who here appears only in fragments. But first, we need to find our way out of that time trap, and indeed, a way out is the title of the second section of the exhibition, which appears in San Francisco, or rather appeared, just around the corner from Luxation. Now, this experience was designed to recreate, using traditional artworks, the very moment of the Buddha's awakening, the very moment he discovered a way out of the time trap. Now, in the sculpture on the left, the Buddha touches the earth with his right hand, and in the halo around his head, which you cannot see clearly here, unfortunately, we find an, an inscription that tells us exactly what the Buddha thought that made him awaken. And basically, this phrase translates as everything arises from and ceases according to causes. Now, the Buddha has these thoughts because he has had a vision, and that is what you see in the painting on the right. Now, this is arguably the single most important image in all of Buddhist art. And in fact, it is the only artwork that the historical Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, ordered to be painted in all of his monasteries, according to the ancient texts. But now you're going to have a question. If Siddhartha Gautama, the historical Buddha, solved this great big cosmic problem, how have we come to know of this solution? Well, the answer is as simple as they come. He decided to teach what he learned. And that is the subject of the third section of the exhibition, Three Revolutions in Buddhist Teachings. So let's look at the star object from this section, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts justly world-famous Gautama Buddha catalog number six, which you see there in parentheses under the pedestal. Now this first object in the third section, Three Revolutions in Buddhist Teachings, actually references the wheel. Take a look at the Buddha's right hand. That okay gesture that he's making, I don't know if you can see me here, but that okay gesture that he's making is intentional. He is showing the wheel of the way right here with the wheel of his right hand, referencing the exact same wheel of existence we just saw. And behind him in the gallery space in San Francisco appeared three paintings. And each one of these paintings represents what we have called the spiritual hero, Vira in Sanskrit, of a set of teachings, each called a turning of the wheel. And together, these three comprise three liberating visions so extraordinary that we dare call them, as does the tradition, revolutions. Now, the first revolution is represented by the painting on the left, the Arhat Bhadra. And he's one of the Buddha's early disciples, and he has mastered the revolutionary teaching that all beings lack a solid self because everything is always changing. Okay, so give this one a thinking shot. Can you find a solid self inside yourself? 
If you cannot, you may be well on your way to understanding what Bhadra did. Now, the second revolution is represented by that painting in the center, the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara. He has mastered the teaching that all things, and all things, excuse me, and not just beings, have no essence. In other words, the first revolution teachings, they didn't go far enough. The arhats stopped too soon. You dig down deep enough through matter to molecules to atoms to probability fields to nothing, and that's where you find emptiness. And by extension, the second revolution teachings suggest that we have compassion for those who think that people and things are solid and suffer needlessly as a result. And such bodhisattvas make an incredible altruistic vow not to leave the cycle of suffering until they have liberated all beings from its grasp. Now, this is incredible, but as you can imagine, it's going to take a long time, three bajillion years, according to the texts. A bajillion is a whole bunch of zeros. So what is a being craving liberation from the time trap that we just explored to do? Are there any shortcuts? Can we speed the process up? Well, that's where the third figure and the third revolution come into the picture. The guy on the right is Kanhapa. He's a figure called a Siddha, a perfected one. But I think the best translation for Siddha is magician. Why? Because Siddhas have mastered the art of visualization, of altering experience with images. In a word, magic. And that is the secret to how the Third Revolution teachings shortcut time. Here's how it works. By visualizing oneself as already enlightened, making a conscious image of oneself as such, it becomes possible to achieve awakening in this very life, in air quotes, in the words of the tradition, lightning fast, as if by magic. And lightning fast is how the tradition entered India from, or entered Tibet from its homeland in India, although it did so in two distinct phases. Now we can identify a very few people whose intent enthusiasm and determination were so intense as to engineer a virtual miracle, the translation of a complete, fully evolved tradition of mental training from its homeland in North India, across the Himalaya, and onto the Tibetan Plateau. Four of the most interesting, inspiring, and important uh, of, of these figures appear in Awaken, and left to right, they are as follows. Padmasambhava, Milarepa with his hand to his ear, Tsongkhapa with the pointy hat, and Virupa, pointing two fingers up toward the sun. Let's take a look at each one in turn and examine their imagery and explore key aspects of their reality-bending stories. Although he's the best kind. Now the first of these figures is likely the most famous, Padmasambhava, the lotus-born one also called Guru Rinpoche, or the precious teacher in the Himalayas. It is ultimately to him that uh, the authorship of the famous Tibetan Book of the Dead that you may have heard of is attributed. During the 8th century, Padmasambhava was instrumental in establishing Buddhism in Tibet. And according to the story, he had been summoned to Tibet by a king, Trisong Detsen, whose first candidate for the job, a monk named Shantarakshita, hadn't been able to fulfill the task. But with his powerful shamanic abilities, Padmasambhava tamed the indigenous spirits of Tibet and converted them to the cause of Buddhism. And in this superb 14th century painting from Virginia, Padmasambhava is flanked by disciples and consorts. Lineage masters of the ancient order, the Nyingma order, surround him. And below him are fierce deities in whose visualization he specializes. And they have gold flecked uh, halos marks them as a 14th century product. Now, every aspect of Padmasambhava is symbolic, both in the sculpture that you see on the left and the painting on the right. The Vajra in his right hand is a spiritual weapon that destroys all illusion, but especially negative emotions. Couldn't we all use that one? And the skull bowl in his left hand is, contains Amrita, uh, the nectar that is the transmuted essence of those same emotions now turned into the stuff of bliss rather than suffering. 
Now the attitudes here both are highly formalized and model specific attitudes to be adopted during meditation. From another perspective, Tibetan artists created these works so they could function, and get this, as the virtual presence of the people they depict. You can experience this virtual presence right now through the web by looking into Padmasambhava's eyes, especially the painting. That one is coming through quite nicely virtually. Finally, an art historical point that might, not, that might seem a geeky and minute at first, but it's not. This is a 14th century painting. How do we know? There's a whole bunch of gold impasto around the halo, and that's a diagnostic to keep in mind when we talk about Tibetan orders in just a second. Now on to our next Siddha, or magician. This is Milarepa. You may have heard of him as well. He's perhaps the second most famous uh, yogi from the Tibetan plateau. Now, Milarepa, his name means the cotton-clad one. And he is the first native Tibetan Buddhist yogi, according to some numerations. He is instantly recognizable by that hand that he holds behind his right ear. He is listening, so go some traditional interpretations, to the voice of his teacher, Marpa, and embodying the nature of the order he helped to found, the Kagyu or oral tradition. See, he's listening to the voice of his master. This order was in the vanguard of the reintroduction of Buddhism into Tibet after the fall of the empire in the ninth century. And fortuitously enough, this timely transmission of the entire corpus of Buddhist thought across the Himalayas preserved it from destruction in India around the year 1200. Now that sculpture that you see on the left is also in, or rather was also in Awaken, and it is remarkable for its consecration, or rather the deposit that makes it a sacred object rather than a picture of any, or a sculpture of anything. Originally, a piece of wood ran down the spine of this sculpture, and it bore three gems, each representing his body, his speech, and his mind. If you look at his eyes, you are again looking at the man, again at least virtually. And in the galleries, we had it set up so that when I was talking about this sculpture, I could stand just to his left, bring visitors right there, and standing where I was, they could see them looking into the corner of his eye. Now, the painting on the right is a wonder of Tibetan art, and it was acquired by the Virginia Museum of Fine Art specifically to enhance collection research associated with this exhibition. It depicts many episodes from Milarepa's life, including, at the bottom right, a legendary tower his hardline teacher Marpa made him build and tear down again and again. Now, Marpa appears in several locations in this painting, um, and there is also a wealth of gold inscriptions all over the place that lets us decode exactly what's happening here. Now, stylistically, if you look at this painting properly, and you can really do this through the web, believe it or not, if you look at it properly, the dimensions encoded on Milarepa's throne make it stand out against the Chinese-style East the Tibetan background where the life stories take place. It is as if Milarepa were floating above them, and this effect is intentional. It's a dimensional transformation that lies at the heart of both Tibetan uh, but Tibetan Buddhist visualization and art. On to our next master. We're going to take a look at Tsongkhapa. Now, Tsongkhapa is the retrospective founder of the Gelug order. This is the order to which the Dalai Lamas belong. Uh, and uh, he is a fascinating figure. So take a look at that sword of wisdom in the book over his shoulders in the sculpture on the left. The sword belongs to a guy named Manjushri. He's the Bodhisattva of Wisdom. And the book on the other lotus right here, if you can see it, that book right there is called the Prajnaparamita, or the Perfection of Wisdom. Now, you can tell where the iconog you can tell what the iconography is saying, yes? Now in the painting, we're dealing with more than a static icon. He sits on the lotus in both, but many figures surround Tsongkhapa in the painting. 
The ones above him are masters in his lineage, and they include, among others, the Bodhisattva Manjushri. And this painting is particularly interesting because of its very many biographical details. It is actually world famous and published in several groundbreaking studies, and it also has many stories yet to tell, including how this great scholar used his magical powers to put out a fire at his monastery. Now, as I mentioned before, Tsongkhapa is famous as the 15th century founder of the Gelug order, the order to which the Dalai Lamas belong, and his scholarly influence so eclipsed that of the previously ascendant Sakya tradition that the latter sought to counter him with a debating master of their own. Meet him we shall, and indeed he will be pivotal on our journey. But first, let's meet the mysterious, uh, let's meet the Indian adept to whom this mysterious debater traced his own lineage, the Master Virupa, or Mr. Ugly. Here he is. And as it turns out, the Asian Art Museum is home to one of the world's most finely crafted Virupa sculptures. Uh, you can see his yoga strap around his knee, and he's got his fingers raised to the sun. Here is the story. It's um, kind of edgy, but then again, so is Virupa. So once upon a time, Virupa was the head abbot of a monastery called Nalanda in North India, and he had been practicing a whole bunch. Uh, he had meditated his whole life, but he had never had any achievements or attainments. Well, he got disgusted, took his meditation beads, threw them in the potty, and gave up uh, his meditation career. Well, that very night, he had a wonderful dream. And in that dream, a meditation goddess came to him and said, Virupa, you are about to be enlightened this very day. Why did you throw your meditation beads in the potty? Go back to the potty and get them and finish your career. He did. He was enlightened that night. And after his enlightenment, what did he do? He was so joyful. He resigned his academic position, put flowers in his hair, which you can see in the painting on the right, and became a traveling teacher in North India. Uh, the hands that he's, uh, you, if you see his two hands there, he's holding those up to stop the sun. Why is he stopping the sun? Well, because he can, partially because of his ma magical powers, but also because he has promised that he will stop drinking beer when the sun goes down. And he's a big fan of beer, so he is going to hold the sun in the sky until he is totally finished. Now, Virupa's stories may be memorable and humorous, but they also encode a philosophical lesson that is absolutely central to Vajrayana Buddhist thought. It's the idea that all apparent conventions are illusory if they are taken seriously. And that leads to the realization uh, and this leads to the realization, leads to power over all phenomena so understood as conventional. Virupa, then, is both a master comedian and a master sorcerer. It's a pretty good combination. Now, your next logical question, how do you transmit and receive the liberating information formulated by any of these lineage founders? Well, such information must be authentic, and there are lots of pretenders out there. So how are we going to tell the real from the false? Well, the answer is that the teachings must be received from an authentic lineage master. And each one of the four orders that we just looked at uh, transmitted its teachings in different ways. And the paintings produced by these orders show how, the, uh, how these different conceptions played out. And I will very briefly tell you, Paintings from the Nyingma order were often hid as treasures. Paintings from the Kagyu order often show figures in these shrine-like arrangements. Paintings that show the transmission lineages of the Gelug order typically take the form of trees. But the most important one today is the one that's in that bottom right corner. Let's see if I can make it appear with my own magical devices. Yes, there it is. That is a characteristic Sakya lineage painting, the same lineage that our friend Virupa came from. The teacher on the left 
turns toward the student on the right. Here is the teacher. Hang on. There's the teacher, and there is the student. And once the, this student receives the teachings, he himself becomes the teacher. Who is facing you right now is the student in the previous painting. He is seated on a lotus platform that springs into three dimensions as the orange and blue palette selectively fatigues the rods and cones in our eyes. This man is Garampa Sonam Senge, the 16th century master of the monastery of Ngor, N-G-O-R, and he will be our imaginative guide into the world that occupies the next gallery. Here, he sits above deities in whose visualization he specialized and beneath the teachers from whom he received his initiation. So here are his teachers and here is what he teaches. He was a staunch opponent of Tsongkhapa, the founder of the Dalai Lama in lineage, and the dedicatory, pardon me, the dedicatory inscription on the reverse of the painting praises both his compassion and his excellence as a guide. So this is why my colleagues and I decided that he would be a perfect uh, virtual teacher for our virtual journey. So at this point, Gorampa Sonam Senge, our teacher, is going to initiate us, his virtual students, so that we can take a journey into the map that you see before you. This map is called a mandala, and the subsequent gallery is organized according to it. So first, we're going to have a preparatory process that Gorampa will put us through. During this process, the most important thing he's going to give us is a map called a mandala. It consists, this is it right here, it consists of nested squares and circles, and it is a visionary palace presented from above in ground, like an architect's ground plan. And this is the mandala that we will enter when we, now duly initiated by Gorampa up here, our guide, uh, exit the first gallery and enter the second. So let's take a quick uh, bird's eye fly overview of this painted mandala. At its corners are four buffalo headed guardians. And then just inside is a five colored circle of flame separating the ordinary world of dualistic per uh, perception from the visionary world inside the mandala. Then you have a black circle punctuated by gold vajras. Here, there they are. Black circle punctuated by gold vajras. Uh, which are stylized lightning bolts. Then another circle right here featuring eight gruesome funereal grounds. And then finally, we can see the petals of a giant lotus peeking out. See, in this circle right along like that. Uh, then after that, we see a square palace. See the square? That's the foundation of the palace. We see the square palace with gateways in the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. Its corridors are populated with more guardians and symbolic weaponry. Here's a bunch of symbolic weaponry and guardians in the corners. There, 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 and then also in the doors as well. And at the center here, there is a mysterious but somehow familiar figure. Garampa, our guide right here, tells us at this point that we will first visualize this palace and then we're going to enter it as if we were in our physical bodies. The visitor to this exhibition will now go into the next gallery, which has been configured according to the, uh, the strictures of this mandala. So let's go check it out. Now the first region in the next gallery, which is effectively that mandala you just saw, the first region is installed toward the left as the visitor enters. And here is the domain of the figure known as Yama, the Pan-Asian god of death. Uh, here he's the fierce protector of the mandala. He keeps the uninitiated from the fiery envi visionary environs inside. And uh, a fierce guardian he is. Embodiment, it might seem, of 
everything horrifying and gruesome look closely. And yet this is executed in precise detail that exceeds the resolution power of the naked eye. Now, take a look at that club in his right hand. It's got a red shaft and a, or pardon me, it's got a white shaft and a skull at the end. And as it turns out, in this exhibition, we installed an object very similar to this staff. Let me show you, it's in his hand right there. We installed one very similar to Yama's only better. It's this one. It is executed uh, in a almost modernist style with spectacular grinning copper teeth uh, looking right out at you. Now, on the reverse of this is a mystery similar to what you will find embodied in Yama. Something miraculous, as you shall see, between sex and death. Because if we were to turn around this flaming trident right here, you would see that the skull itself is a, a phallic in form. So life and death all at once, a hallmark of Himalayan Buddhist artistic thought. Now, having passed on by Yama, the paragon of death, generation, and the horror of them, we are ready to face a guy named Mahakala. He is the enlightened protector par excellence. Now, literally, this name Mahakala right here means great time. And here you see him in both two dimensions and three dimensions. Now, formally, the figures who appear in the mandala that our guide Gorampa has shown us are all variations on this Mahakala theme. And it appears again and again in the mandala. And yet, time, Kala, is not the absolute it appears to be. Indeed as our uh, contemporary artist featured in this exhibition, Tsering Sherpa, shows us, time is rather infinitely malleable. Here, the modern mage Tsering Sherpa has progressively distorted a source Mahakala, you see the image right here, seen at the bottom right, and what he has done is repeatedly iterated mathematical algorithm twisting, 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 twisting Mahakala until he takes on this form. And the resultant anamorphic distortion that you see right here might bear very little resemblance to the original image right here at the bottom right. Uh, I can show you the skull garland. See the skulls right there? I can show you his tiger skin skirt. Uh, I, here's the swirly face. In fact, you probably are seeing the swirly face now. But the important thing to recognize about this painting is how stunning it is. And beyond that, to appreciate the idea that a signal can lose coherence and yet be reconstituted if the proper algorithm is known. And that is powerful and pertinent, not just to Tibetans, but to all of us today. I think we would agree. Now, Turning from Mr. Sherpa's painting, two pillars and a tapestry translate the entrance to the mandala as it appears on the painting map into the geography of the gallery. Now, these two awesome pillars that you see right here are from the Newark Museum of Fine Arts, and the tapestry overhead right there is from the Asian Art Museum collection. And this, this is so neat, this reveals a mandala unwrapped. If you know those Mesopotamian cylinder seals, you'll understand what I'm talking about. It's like a cake wrap. It's like the wrapping around a mandala that has been taken apart and laid flat. And if you take a look at the red door, it's tea tiny, but you can see it. I've got the cursor going around it. See that red door opening in the center above you? As you go through this space, as you walk between the pillars, you see another weird door right in front, and it's this one. So let's see what it has to teach us. We're going into the next section, the gallery of ritual equipment. And this is an important symbolic place. Physically, this door marks a highly secret chamber called the Gongkong. But in another sense, it marks that place beyond which the ego cannot go without perishing. But that's okay. See the skull smiling? Yeah. Grateful Dead, that's because the ego 
whose metaphorical decapitation they represent is nothing but a pool of tears. And the cutting blades of these ritual weapons right here, they're removing obstacles, false identifications, and thus again, metaphorically decapitating the ego, ideally leaving nothing behind but joy. And yet there will be more ritual weapons arrayed to our left in the gallery, in the gallery of ritual equipment, uh, and they occupy on Garampa's mandala, uh, an area that's highlighted on a kiosk that we'd installed, but unfortunately I can't show you here because I don't have an example, but I could show you some of the ritual objects. We have arranged these wonderful and mis uh, mysterious ritual objects into several functional groups. Uh, you'll find a number of musical instruments that uh, perform initiatory or magical functions. You see a crown that transforms the wearer into a virtual Buddha. That would be this right here. Other objects gather positive energy. This prayer wheel right here contains mantras, which it recites as the prayer wheel is turned. And this finely crafted example bears the Om Mani Padme Hum, the mantra of Avalokiteshvara. Now over here, we see a purba or a three-bladed dagger. And this pins recalcitrant negativities to one spot. And this is the uh, weapon that Padma Sambhava, who we met a little while ago, used to tame the native demons of Tibet. Its three blades emerge from the mouth of a mythic crocodile called a makara. It's right there. And its three heads, right here, symbolize a philosophical formula called the three gates to liberation, the empty, the signless, and the intentionless. Applied magically, as it were, to an apparently physical object, they immobilize it and dissolve it into the nothingness from whence it came. Other sets of weapons include uh, a skull bowl, a chopper, and a vajra and a bell. The vajra and the bell right here on the left are really important because together they symbolize the most important uh, concept in all of Himalayan Buddhism, which is non-duality. Now, if we're going to understand non-duality, we're going to have to understand something really challenging. And it's probably the most challenging aspect of this exhibition. Luckily, it's also the coolest object. At this point, after you've passed the gallery of ritual equipment and been introduced to some of the philosophical ideas that it introduces, you will have arrived at the very center of that mandala we were talking about several slides ago. You'll be in its central chamber, and you will see a wonderful, terrifying figure loom out of the darkness in stunning detail. Now, his eyes are fixed on yours. Perhaps as you gaze into the, into the sculpture, you'll see intricacy on intricacy. And if you, the visitor, are not moved or even transfixed, I can't help you. Trust us, this is a, was a powerful experience. And I wish I could play the soundtrack for you right now, but you're going to have to check out the Guto monks on that for yourself. Now, this is a stunning experience, as I said, but maybe some of you who've been looking really close have already recognized who this is. You've met them before. It's the same figure as in Luxation only he's been reconstituted. When you have the key to reconstituting the figure, which we give you in the exhibition, even the most messed up image can be reordered. Even the worst poison can be transmuted into fuel for awakening. And that includes the problem of death, whose nature completely changes when we, as we have just done, completely face him. For what was once terrifying, now is something more joyful. So in the next section of the exhibition, the first thing you see is that very same fierce figure, Vajrabhairava, that guy, that guy. You see him again, only now he has changed fundamentally. He is no longer dark and terrifying. He is now golden and appears to be, hang on, look close. He is golden and he appears to be smiling. Hmm. 
Maybe it's because he is now not alone, but rather in the company of his consort, Vajravetali. Now, figures of this type are known as Yab Yum, or father mother in Tibetan, for obvious reasons, and visualizing them in this way is thought to bring about swift awakening. Now, from one perspective, this is because uh, they symbolize most fundamentally that concept I mentioned a moment ago non duality, which is specifically the notion that seeming opposites like male and female, me and you, self and world, mind and matter are not binary opposites, but rather analogous regions along a continuum of complementarity. Now, the freeing of the mind from its bondage to dualistic extremes and the experience of non-duality is the aim of the Tibetan texts called Gyud or Tantra in Sanskrit. And these texts all center on a Yabhyum deity of which we see three examples here. These stunning artworks can at first seem an intimidating riot of heads, arms, implements, in a frenzy of sacred activity, and, and I suppose in a sense, one must admit that indeed they are that. Nonetheless, each of them seduces the eyes and mind in its own distinctive way, so much so that by the end of the exhibition, it was our hope that visitors would appreciate the passion of Guhya Samaja uh, at the top left, uh, whose name means secret union. And here, the secret union in question is always that between apparent opposites. So here's Guhya Samaja, just so you can tell if you're not reading Sanskrit fast. Uh, the secret union in question is always between apparent opposites as symbolized by its most viscerally human hieroglyph, sexual union on a truly transordinary scale. Or how, if you could see it in full detail, each one of these little globes in Haruka's hands itself has another Buddha figure in it. Incredible detail. How about the dynamism of Chakrasamvara? This is another Asian art museum sculpture right here. The controller of the wheels in the body, you know, the energy centers in the body. This sculpture, as our conservators have discovered, is <clears throat> fully anatomically correct. And in, shall we say, loving detail. So much so, as with, Vajri, as with so much Vajrayana art, the closer you look, the more you'll find. Now, a moment ago, I mentioned that the Yabhyum figures are hieroglyphs of non-duality. And since we completed our journey to the center of the mandala and checked out that incredibly terrifying sculpture of Vajrabhairava, the god of death there, we faced our fears. And now we can appreciate the idea might sound odd at first, but in the end, it's quite intuitive that opposites like luminous and dark, light and solid, morph into and indeed mutually constitute one another. And in the last experience of the exhibition, we give the visitors an opportunity to see how that might happen visually. This takes the form of a solid stone Buddha floating, as it were, in midair. Uh, this is obviously not a sideshow trick, but it gives the it gave the viewer or gave uh, it gave the viewer an opportunity to experience a world class Paula artwork, illumined as such objects seldom are in museums, in a manner that allows the attentive viewer's perception to switch figure and ground, seeing that both figure and ground appear in the mind, and thus revealing the mind as the ruler, or in this case, could we say the crowned king? Uh, of all the disparate phenomena it necessarily includes. And to see it as such in the Vajrayana estimation is awakening itself. But eventually, uh, this is the last shot from Virginia Museum of Fine Arts install. It's a mirror. I thought it was ingenious because eventually we have to go back to the ordinary world. We have to chop wood and carry water as the old Zen saying goes. So what insights are the visitor and are you as a visitor going to take with you? Are you going to have a greater appreciation for the sophisticated mental technology of Tibet? 
will you see how its art is all about awareness? Or my favorite question, will you take it for granted that you are awake? I really appreciate your time. And now I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was enlightening, if I you know, can use that pun. But, I love um, all puns. <laughs> well, I definitely had the pleasure of seeing this exhibition at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts when it was up. And I have to say, like having entered the center, you know, entering the, I guess the center with Vajra Bhairava being so dark, but then you have the, the chanting soundtrack. And then the transition into the light when you're confronted with being the Buddha, the Pala sculpture, but you, yeah, it's a visceral reaction. Like you feel it. That was the goal. Uh, John, my, my colleague, John Henry and I were going, how is it that we can take something that is so distant apparently from our ordinary daily experience and show that in fact it is not distant, but it, it's the distilled essence of our everyday experience. How we have figure and ground in our minds and our bodies and our experience all the time. What we wanted to do was to create a situation where that, where, where that dynamic that's usually in the background of awareness becomes foregrounded. And we wanted to use the best art to create it. Not anything fancy and digital, but the best traditional and contemporary art. Absolutely. And I have to say, I think I failed in all the lessons because once I exited the exhibition, I felt disappointment. Like, oh, I have to be back in the mundane world, in the ordinary world. The beautiful part about this sort of philosophical system is that it becomes so easy to say, hey, absolutely everything is empty. So if there is no self to be found anywhere, uh, you can't find it in the exhibition, nor can you find it outside the exhibition. It is all beautiful, luminous emptiness. That's wonderful. So uh, Victor Taylor from Facebook has a question for you, Jeff. Uh, first, he says, thanks. Sorry, I missed the exhibit. <laughs> but he also asks, uh, could you discuss more about the visual representation of extremes morphing into each other? Oh, boy, this is. This is actually going to be the subject of an upcoming exhibition uh, called Hell. Uh, we're going to do another Hell show. And one of the things that we'll be looking at is how imagery that is intended to be terrifying or, or grotesque ends up morphing into the humorous. And we find this all the time in Himalayan Buddhist art, too. You may, uh, Victor, you may have picked this up with the Virupa. Virupa actually means um, it, either Mr. Ugly or Distorted. Uh, and yet that is one of the most magnificently beautiful sculptures that we have in the collection. Beauty and distortion morphing into and through one another. Um, violence and, and sexuality, creation and destruction morph into one another. That Yama painting that we took a look at and that you may have taken an even closer look at has all of that there in one tableau. Everything from the ultimate violence of of uh, death and violation to, uh, to creativity. And I think that the point there is to show, think nothing, the point is to show that all opposites come back, everything bends back around. And when you can see that entirety, that's when you've seen that holistic wheels kind of situation that we saw at the start, the whole thing. Great. Now, am I making a, a horrible, comparison when I say that the time trap really sounds a lot like the matrix. Like, is there? The time trap is the matrix in a way. Uh, one, of, one of the great things about the, the movie, The Matrix, is that it took this situation that, they, that we are all so familiar with and it made it, it concentrated it and put it in a little space so we could recognize what's going on. And what, what John Henry and I wanted to do with the time trap is the same kind of thing. It's mm -hmm. to show that we are in fact not not in an idea, but in fact, caught in a series of loops. And that, that is part and parcel of the everyday. And, and yeah, in fact, it may be part and parcel. The essence of is those repeating patterns. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the matrix, the time trap, same thing. 
you have decoded the sci-fi influences. Well, David McCoy at Facebook says, thank you. Thank you for that. And um, Victor over at Facebook also has a second follow-up question. He asks, could you go back to the image that had several layers, including the square palace in the center, so the mandala? Ah, uh -huh. that's the could most important one. one. Yeah. I would be more than happy to do that. Let me go over here. This, if I were to properly, uh, uh, just if we were sitting down, we had about three hours to talk, we would start with this image right here because uh, we designed the exhibition around this image. This figure right here at the center, that's that same guy as the great big growling uh, wooden sculpture that's the centerpiece of the show. And that's also Tsering Sherpa's, Lux the subject of Tsering Sherpa's luxation. Um, you may or may not have seen this. Tibetan artists don't often do this, but sometimes mandalas like this are created in three-dimensional form. Uh, there's mm -hmm. one that is still extant at the Potala Palace in Lhasa in Tibet, and it is stunning to see what this actually represents and to see it transformed into a three-dimensional form. Um, it's triple stunning because what a meditator does in the course of mastering this is learn to replicate this in three dimensions and travel through it in the mind's eye. Mm -hmm. And of course, to recreate an experience like that is any curator's great dream. That's for next century, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Great. And so uh, before we leave, I just want to acknowledge uh, Michael Holy's question on Facebook where he asked, will this presentation be available to watch somewhere afterwards? Yes. Um, after we conclude this live broadcast, it will be available here on this um, Facebook page, but also on our YouTube page. And so first, Jeff, I so want to thank you. This has been enlightening. It has been educational and I, you certainly help to simplify the mandala and the experience of awakening. I really appreciate y'all inviting me. It's a real pleasure and privilege to get to hang out with you and talk about my favorite subject. Thanks. And so I also want to give a big thank you to our digital team for producing this program. And finally, a bigger thank you to our audience out there for sharing this experience with us. We certainly welcome you back for more programs on our social platforms. And for our upcoming program, please visit our website at thewalters.org. Goodbye for now. Thank you. <laughs>